All right, everyone, we have quite a few people who've already joined and it's noon. And so I want to get things started because we have a lot of great content that we're going over today. So I want to make sure we have enough time to have discussion and hear from our great speakers today. Um, so I wanted to start by introducing myself. My name is Kate Bennington. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. I work for the Center of Persons with Disabilities at Utah State University in their early intervention program. Um, I'm also part of a LEND program, Leadership in Education and Neurodevelopment. Um, that's kind of what started this project and this webinar series is um, there's a team of us that are participating in the LEND program that are that have put this specific series on and so i'm going to let my other team members introduce themselves just so you kind of know who we are and you'll we'll be in breakout rooms later so you'll get to know us a little bit better but we'll start with kirsten because she's the first one on my screen i am Kristen alberg and i am a physical therapist i work at dvi vantage in salt lake city in early intervention and then i also teach at the university of utah thanks kirsten all right carrie ann you're next hi everyone i'm carrie ann duncan i'm also a pediatric physical therapist i work in outpatient and um, private practice Okay, thanks, Carrie Ann. Kelsey, you're next on my screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Christopher. I am um, a LEND trainee from Montana and um, what's called a community trainee. So I, I wear several different hats with different jobs, but um, looking forward to the presentation today and thanks for being with us. Thanks. And Adrian. My name is Adrian Siemens. I am from Idaho. And I am a PhD student in special education at the University of Idaho, and I'm also in the LEN training, as well as a behavioral co consultant for a local school district. Awesome, thank you. So that, that's kind of our team. We also have Janelle Preston, who um, will be helping us. She'll be taking role and doing a lot of logistical things, managing the breakout rooms for us. So we're really grateful for all her help and all that she's doing. Um, but yeah, we're excited to begin this early intervention ECHO series and um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, first, um, we are recording this session um, for educational purposes and quality improvement. And by participating and signing up for this webinar series, um, you are consenting to be recorded. So if this is something you're not comfortable with, then you're free to get disconnect if you feel um, that that's necessary. Also, this um, ECHO is a worldwide organization. So if anyone is join, joining from the European Union, um, please let us know so that we can best assist you. Um, but yeah, and we'll talk a little bit like after our presentations, after our case presentations at the end, we'll talk about how you guys can get access to this recording and watch it at a later time if you so desire. Um, really what makes these ECHO series meaningful and most um, useful for all of us is if that we get lots of participation and that we can have this be an interactive dialogue between the presenters and all you community members who are participating. Um, we you know, wanna hear your questions and we wanna hear feedback from the case um, presenters. Um, and so just having that dialogue is really key. So we hope that you guys all feel comfortable and are willing to participate throughout today's series. Um, when you are participating, please be mindful to protect individual privacy. So if you're talking and sharing information about another person, avoid using their first names, their middle names or last names. Um, avoid identifying any family members or friends or anything that can really um, help someone know who they are. So really emphasizing the de-identifying examples. If you're unsure about something but want to share it, um, reach out to one of us team members. We have asterisks next to our name so you can identify who you are or reach out to Janelle who's under the project scope name. Um, if you have questions about sharing any information and we can let you know if it's appropriate or not. 
Um, something that we would like to do is if everybody would rename their profile um, just below their little image so that we can see first year first and last name. Um, we also would, are curious to know where you're coming from and this slide states your organization, but we really are curious to know about what state you are practicing in just because we have reached out to multiple states and so you can see as an example with mine, it says my first and last name and I am working in Utah. So if you guys could rename your profile, that would be really helpful. Um, also, some of you guys have already done this, but if you could please put um, your contact information in the chat, that would be really helpful for us um, to take role and also to be able to reach out to send you uh, resources. So please add your contact information to the chat. Um, this, this slide describes how to raise your hand. However, we're, we're gonna ask that we hold off questions until after the presentation. Our presenters have a lot of great contact that or information that they wanna go over. So um, we wanna give them the time to be able to do so. And then you can put, um, we can ask questions after. We'll have some time after the presentation um, before we do breakout rooms that you can ask some of those questions. And then um, this is just our contact information if you want to pre-register for further uh, for other ECHO sessions that we'll be having. We do have another one coming up on March 30th. Um, so if you guys haven't registered for that, um, please do. You can um, contact this email earlyecho at usu.edu to be able to register for that. And by pre-registering, you get early access to any session material and handouts. So it's great to do that. We also are offering credit for attendance for this participating in this webinar. Um, how to get that is by, you know, watching the whole session and then after you fill out the survey that's sent to you, um, usually we send it the day after we meet. So tomorrow, anticipate an email from Early Echo regarding a survey that you can take about today's session. And once that um, survey is completed, then we'll be able to forward that certificate of attendance so that you can use that. And if you have any questions about that at any point, don't hesitate to reach out um, to that email earlyecho at usu.edu. All right, so we're about to jump in um, to our presentations, but I wanted to just outline a little bit of what today will look like. We'll start with a presentation from Catherine, Dr. Catherine Picard and Dr. Nicole Hendricks. And they'll share some useful information about for us for about social communication. And that will last about 30 to 45 minutes. After that, that's the time that we'll be able to ask questions for the presenters and um, you guys can be able to talk with them for a minute and then we'll have a case presentation. So Kirsten Alberg has agreed to present a case for us um, about a child that she's working with. And she has some specific questions that are applicable to the presentation that we're having today. So um, she'll share that information with us and then we'll break out in uh, breakout rooms to be able to come up with strategies and suggestions to be able to help her in her case. And then we'll come together and be able to talk a little bit more about that. But that is um, kind of a quick rundown of um, everything, how today's gonna look. Um, and just another reminder that if you haven't yet put your contact information in the chat, we would really appreciate that so that we can be able to send you any resources. So with that, we'll start um, by introducing our presenters. We have 
Dr. Picard, who is an assistant professor at the Marcus Autism Center and Emory School of Medicine. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Michigan State University and completed two year postdoctoral fellowship at JFK Partners at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Her primary research interest is in the translation of evidence-based practices into community systems that are naturally positioned to serve children with ASD and developmental delays. Um, we also have Nicole Hendricks. Um, she is an assistant professor at the Marcus Autism Center and Emory University School of Medicine as well. She received her doctorate in school psychology from the University of Iowa. And as a licensed psychologist, Dr. Hendricks conducts ASD diagnostic evaluations with children and adolescents and provides caregiver mediated interventions for toddlers with ASD. Her clinical and research interests include increasing accessibility of effective early intervention and examining mechanisms by which to facilitate early identification of neurodevelopmental disabilities. So these two ladies are wonderful and I'm so glad they're joining us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that they can share their slides with us. All right, awesome. You guys got that up so quickly. Great. <laughs> that was fast. I know, off to a good start. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So yeah, we'll probably go, let's see, it's um, 12, 11 right now. So we'll probably go till about um, 12, 50. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll let you know when you're getting close to time and then we'll take questions after that. Awesome. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for introducing us. <clears throat> um, we are, Nicole and I are really excited to be here today and giving this presentation. I feel like it's been a challenging year with the pandemic, but one of the things that it's also shown us is the power of telehealth to broadly share information and also to connect people. And I feel like the ECHO model is just a fantastic representation of that. So we're excited to be here and excited to be talking to you guys today. Um, broadly speaking, our learning objectives for today are to talk about evidence-based early intervention strategies for young children who either have autism or who may be at high risk um, for developing autism based on having social communication delays. And so some of what we'll be talking about today may be strategies that you already know or already are familiar with, but our hope is to provide a name for what those strategies are and to really group them together into what we would consider an evidence-based framework. Um, and so specifically, we'll start off talking about the importance of the early intervention system for at-risk toddlers, um, something that you all are likely familiar with. Um, we'll then talk about key social communication skills, so specifically what these evidence-based strategies target. Um, and then we'll be diving into what are the strategies themselves. And you'll hear us use the term a lot, NDBI, um, and that stands for Naturalistic Developmental and Behavioral Intervention Strategies. Um, and it's a really fancy term to describe a set of strategies that are core to a lot of early intervention models for toddlers who are at high risk for autism. Um, so we'll be talking through what those specific strategies are. We'll talk very briefly at the end about parent coaching um, because a lot of these strategies are embedded within parent coaching models. So we'll end with that and then talk about next steps. Um, so to start off, um, I think it makes sense to talk about why we would be giving this talk in the EI system or to, or to providers who are in the EI system. Um, and part of that is because that we know that it's a critical system when we think about serving toddlers who are at risk for ASD. Um, and so obviously Part C is able to serve children birth to three who have very developmental delays. Um, and the important thing about the Part C system is that it captures kids who may not have a medical diagnosis of autism. Um, and that's important because one of the things that we know is that most children 
do not receive medical diagnoses of autism until after they are 36 months of age. And so even though as a field um, and as clinicians, we know early intervention is critical, many kids are not gonna enter specialty clinics um, because those clinics require medical diagnoses. And so we really need to be thinking about where are these kids? Um, and so we think about these toddlers who are at risk as predominantly being served in the EI system. Um, and so just to give you a sense of the prevalence of, you know, about how many kids um, are served in the EI system who would be considered at risk for autism. Um, there was a recent study that was conducted, um, and this was actually out of Massachusetts. Um, and what the study did is they did kind of a multi-step screening approach um, within their early intervention system. Um, and what it showed was that um, kind of at the end of the study, about 10% of kids in the EI system in Massachusetts ultimately went on to obtain an autism diagnosis. And so if you think about that, that's a, that's a large percentage of kids being served. Um, and I can say in the Georgia EI system that those numbers are somewhat similar. Um, about 10% of the kids seen in Georgia in the EI system screen as at risk for autism. So really, when you think about the EI system, we're thinking about it capturing a, a, a large group of kids who are in this at-risk category. So I think the take home from that um, is that today we'll broadly be talking about children who are at risk for autism, and we'll be talking about social communication delays specifically. Um, this could be kids who have autism or who have a known diagnosis of autism, um, but it also could be children who don't have that diagnosis um, and children who have other types of developmental delays in the targeted areas that we'll be talking about. And we'll get into those in a little bit. One of the things that we know is that many interventions for this at-risk group of kids um, share the same strategies. And so actually, if you were to kind of pull up video examples of some of our evidence-based intervention models, they look very similar. And they look similar because they use the best practice strategies that we're gonna talk about today. So we'll be talking, kind of taking a step out um, and really thinking about what are those strategies that are shared across all of these early intervention models and what do they look like? So one of the important things to know before we dive into the strategies themselves is that most of the strategies that we're talking about today specifically target social communication because right we're talking about toddlers who are at risk for autism who have social communication delays. Um, and one of the one of the things to know is obviously social communication is a broad term. Um, and I think it's, it's thrown around and, and used. And sometimes it can be hard to know, well, what does that actually mean? If it, what does it mean for a child to have social communication delays? Um, and so when we think about social communication, um, for this presentation, we're really talking about four core areas. Um, and we're gonna dive into each of these more specifically but we're talking about social engagement, communication, imitation, and play. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about what each of these areas are and what they look like, um, but keeping in mind that the strategies, these NDBI strategies target these four core areas. Um, so the first strategy that I wanna talk about, and I really view this as just being like at the foundation of NDBI strategies. The first skill is social engagement. Um, and when I think about social engagement, I think about kind of um, active interest, active attention, active reciprocity with another person. Um, and when I think about autism, again, this is one of the first kind of skill areas that comes to mind because oftentimes, this is at kind of the core of autism. And so we see toddlers um, who have autism or who are at risk for autism have difficulty maintaining interactions. And so what that looks like is 
having a hard time sticking with someone, right? Or sticking with an activity. Um, and so really kind of moving from one thing to another, but having trouble staying there. But even within an activity, right? So it's not just about how long you're there. It's also about what happens when you're with another person. And so we look at things like how much does a child share kind of their interest with another person? Do they hold things up to show you them? You know, do they point things out to you? Um, and are they responding to you as well? So when you point something out to them, are they able to follow you and, and really kind of show their interest in the interaction? And then, you know, um, a really important thing that I think falls within social engagement is we think about turn-taking. Um, this is a critical skill. Um, and oftentimes we see that kids who have difficulty with social engagement and who are at risk for autism um, often have, have a hard time going back and forth and taking turns. In addition to social engagement, that kind of next skill area is communication. Um, in my experience in working with families, um, especially families in the EI system and families of young children, this is often at the forefront of their goals, right? Is how can I support my child in talking and expressing themselves? Um, but it's important to know that communication starts kind of before talking, right? It starts with eye contact, early vocalizations and gestures. Um, and we use communication for, for all different purposes. Um, so we use it to make requests. We use it to share information. We use it to protest, you know? Um, and so when we think about communication, we're thinking about it on a much bigger kind of picture. You know, we're thinking about it taking many different forms and being used for many different functions. Um, the important thing, this last bullet here, is that, you know, communication obviously involves both expressing yourself and also kind of understanding and following direction. So that receptive form of communication. Um, and so we do think about both expressive and receptive communication with these strategies. In um, kids who are kind of at high risk for autism, we see difficulties with communication, um, including all of the aspects that we've talked about before, that I just mentioned. Um, and so that is difficulty expressing communication, but also difficulty using communication for lots of different purposes. And so a child may be able to make a, requ a request quite well, um, but they may not be using language to share information or to protest, right? Um, and so we do see communication difficulties being pronounced. Um, and the other thing to think about, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to the strategies, is one of the things that we see is also using communication spontaneously. And so sometimes kids may need extra help to use the communication that they, they do have through something like a prompt or a reminder um, to use their communication. And so we really are thinking about not just what communication is used, but how can we help communication be more spontaneous? The last two skill areas um, I view as being fairly related, especially in toddlers. Um, and so these are imitation and play. Um, imitation um, is huge. Um, and many of the strategies that we We'll talk about today target imitation. It plays a critical role in social communication development um, because kids learn a whole lot through imitation. And that's through imitating gestures. It's through imitating kind of actions. Um, it's through imitating vocalizations. Um, and I view imitation as being really kind of um, rooted in that social engagement skill that we talked about before. In order for a child to imitate, right, um, and to know to imitate and to, to see the, the value in it, oftentimes that means that we're tuning into people and understanding that what other people doing, are doing is important. And then the last skill area is play. Um, and this is really important for toddlers and young children. And the reason for that is that 
like imitation, um, kids learn quite a bit through play. Um, they learn a lot about the social world, about social norms. Um, we can teach things like turn-taking in play. Um, and it also teaches problem-solving skills and imagination. Play becomes more complex as children get older. Obviously, it starts with fairly basic cause and effect play to more functional play where toys are being used for their intended purpose but then gradually moves on to pretend play and imaginary play. Um, and those are really, really important skills to understand things like theory of mind. There are a lot of different tools to assess social communication. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things that we'll be talking about in the ECHO presentation on the 30th is actually a specific checklist that can be used to kind of tease apart where a child's skills are at in these given areas. Um, but we'll be talking about one of many, right? There are observational tools you can use. Um, there are formal assessments that you can use. Um, and then there are also checklists that you can use. Um, and I think the important thing when assessing social communication skills um, well, maybe two things. One is that it's extremely important to obviously have your own kind of observation as a kind of therapist. It's also incredibly important to solicit caregivers' perceptions of their child's social communication development because those are ex extremely informative in thinking about what sorts of things are caregivers seeing at home. And ultimately, when we move forward to actually targeting, you know, these skills, through NDBI strategies, it helps us hone in on where, where parents are at and what their priorities are. Um, the second reason it's a, important to kind of assess social communication skills, um, and I believe Nicole will talk about this in a little bit, is that we know that these skills, you know, social engagement, communication, imitation and play, they develop in the same order, same sequence, irrespective of whether a child is at risk for autism. And so, you know, we, we see often that functional play develops before a child then learns pretend play. And so if we understand where a child's current skill level is at, we then are able to understand what skill they're going to learn next, right? And those are important because they help us to set goals as therapists that are developmentally appropriate that are the skills that a child would naturally learn next. And so again, we'll be talking about a specific checklist in the presentation on March 30th, um, but know that there are a range of tools to help you kind of assess a child's social communication skills and what areas specifically they might need additional support in. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Well then, how does this look? And so this is the piece where we'll jump into thinking about some of these best practice strategies that are drawing from the variety of NDBIs that are available. But before we jump into those specific strategies, we're thinking about where does NDBI come from? And so when we think about best practices for toddlers, especially those who have social communication deficits like those of autism, we definitely wanna be pulling from developmental interventions. So teaching, families and caregivers and clinicians how to more effectively respond to the skills and the communication that a child is giving, which in turn then increases the responsivity from the child. We also think about behavioral interventions that are embedded within natural environments that are based within applied behavior analysis or ABA. And by thinking about ABA, we think about, yes, we're targeting specific skills and how can we support the development of those skills on the front end, thinking about Anna's students, thinking about also what's going to be most motivating to that child in the natural environment as those consequences. So those antecedents and consequences that, we're that we are manipulating or better understanding within ABA, but thinking about those within the environments where the child lives. And so we crash those together to create NDBIs and thinking about how we can use those in our meaningful daily routines. So I'm not thinking about a separate time to do practice or a separate time to do these therapy strategies, but how do we find a way to embed these within snack time, into bath time, the play that we're already doing with, um, with our siblings or with our family members? And to do that, we first need to think about how can we create an environment that's most effective for learning? 
we start similar to if you were working with um, with a trainer, we think about we got to set aside time to make sure that this is prioritized. And so we work with families to identify when might be the best time within their the existing routines and the existing schedules, thinking about do we add this to what's already existing or do we find a time that it best fits within? So does this best fit within a bedtime routine or right after breakfast whenever the, the caregiver and the child are already engaging together? We think about how can we make this clear, not only with respect to time to the child, so this, this becomes a routine, but also how do we set up a space that becomes very clear of this is this is the practice or the, the playtime um, and how can we use the environment so moving furniture or thinking about how to set that up more effectively. Like all people, little kids too, uh, we have to limit distractions, right? So if there were a lot of things going on in the background right now, y'all wouldn't be paying attention to me. So how do we pay attention to limiting those things that are specifically distracting to the child? And also, how can we be intentional about the activities or the, the play materials that are available so that they're novel engaging? So if I'm engaging with a child and the toy is very fun, then I'm inherently more fun too. So we teach some of these strategies to the, the caregivers as well. Oops, let me get that out of the way. Um, as we start with some of those developmental strategies, Catherine touched upon some of the skills that we're building in the child. And to be able to build those skills in the child, we have to be able to model them ourselves. And so one of the first skills that we're teaching is thinking about how can we imitate the child? So how can we attend to what the child is doing and then copy or imitate it? This can be related to vocalizations or gestures or play behaviors. And this is effective because it grabs others' attention. When we imitate others, it, it pulls their attention to us. And it teaches that those behaviors are meaningful. If a child's vocalizing and then another person responds to that vocalization, even if it wasn't intended for that other person, that teaches that that vocalization has purpose here. Um, and then like I mentioned is that by imitating others, we are then more in tune with others and we're likely to imitate them ourselves. So a great opportunity for teaching with young kids. And how this can look is we can do this within play. If a child's rolling cars, we can roll a car right alongside them talking about what we're doing. If the child's interested in a tea set, maybe I pull the, the teacup up to my mouth as well. We can do this during daily routines too. So during snacks, we can be sharing a snack together. And as the child takes a bite, I take a bite too. We can do this during social routines or songs and, and games that we play like peekaboo, um, mirroring not only the vocalizations and those actions, but also those facial expressions or just the the, the emotion that's coming through the child in that moment. That doesn't mean we imitate everything, right? So we're still setting clear boundaries um, and we're responding as we would as clinicians, as adults, as parents of making it clear that some behaviors are appropriate for imitation and responding as we typically would with some of those more challenging behaviors. During this time too, we're pulling from those developmental interventions to think about how do we intentionally model language and play to set an example for other children, for the children. So we think about not only using simple language, so hinting at what Catherine was mentioning earlier about finding that developmentally appropriate language that's best matched to where the child is. If a child's speaking in phrases, obviously we are gonna try and mirror some of that language of also speaking in phrases and perhaps the next step up of some of those short sentences. If a child's not using their vocalizations yet to communicate and maybe not even effectively using gestures to communicate, we think about how can we model single words as well as um, clear gestures that can get their, the child's needs met. Um, so we're acting as though we're a sportscaster or a narrator, giving a play-by-play -play in a developmentally appropriate language. We're also thinking about how can we exaggerate, right? So naturally, whenever we are presenting, I'm gonna be over, over the top with my expressions and my gestures. And we do the same thing whenever we're interacting so that we're drawing attention to the communication and play strategies that we're modeling. We're coming back to some of that language over and over again so that we're creating social routines within our language. For example, ready, set, go, one, two, three. We're using some of the same words throughout our play so that we're not only helping to create predictability, but also we're helping understanding and eventual use of language. As Catherine mentioned, turn-taking is so crucial in thinking about social communication, not only at an early age, but as we continue to grow up and as we transition to conversation and more complex relationships. And so at an early age, we're thinking about how can we work with the child to be able to have shared control of the activity between the child and the adult. 
Um, and this can look a lot of different ways. If we're thinking for some young children, we're thinking about that turn taking in the context of social game, even being able to go back and forth, taking turns with imitation of making facial expressions in the mirror. We can think about it more basic of whenever we start to pull into toys. So we might throw a ball back and forth. And then this becomes more and more complex moving into, for example, playing soccer, or playing baseball, or playing a board game. Um, but early on, we're thinking, how can we support the child in being able to accept that turn or be interested in that playful way that we are interrupting um, what's expected within the play? With the goal being that this helps to facilitate some of that re reciprocity within play and then also eventually within language. Within all of these, these NDBIs, we're thinking about how can we focus what our instruction or in teaching looks like around what the, is of the child's interest. Um, and this can be referred to as child's choice or following the child's lead. Like Catherine mentioned, we're pulling these strategies across NDBIs and there's just gonna be different jargon across those different NDBIs. Um, and then from there, we're focusing first on what the child's interested in and then presenting teaching opportunities within these activities. This is not unlike an adult conversation. If for example, you came to me and started to tell me about your weekend and then I diverted you in a completely different direction, you don't wanna keep talking to me, right? So we think about the same strategies whenever we're engaging with children of letting them begin to lead before we might eventually divert it in a different direction related to some of those new skills that we're teaching. Um, and I wanted to draw attention to the bottom picture here of you see the child's interest here might not be the type of functional play or the play that we expect. So this particular child, he seems to be most interested in flicking that light switch on and off. And if there's an opportunity for us to perhaps imitate and follow his interests, to get down on his level and talk about on, off, um, to be able to capture some of that social engagement first, then to move into some of that turn taking of seeing if, for example, can I playfully interrupt what he's doing or can I create a game where we're taking turns um, his goal of eventually being able to flip that light switch back on and off, which was where he initially started, that can serve as that natural reinforcement. So this is where we start to bring in some of those principles of ABA, where we're thinking about what is the specific skill that we want from the child to be developing, which might be, for example, for him to more effectively communicate by directing his eye contact for him to let me know that he wants to keep flipping the light switch on and off. Um, that natural reinforcement or that natural reward for him might be to then flip the light switch on and off, but I'm hoping that I'm also creating a lot more natural reinforcers throughout this interaction. Um, and I took out the slide related to natural reinforcement so that we didn't you know, blather on incoherently. Um, but thinking about natural reinforcement, that's pulling from ABA, but it's, it's this idea of a process of not just that reinforcers are rewards, but the rewards that work so that they're helping to build some of those skills. And we want them to be natural or embedded into the child's natural environment so that the child encounters them more often. If, for example, the child looks to me um, to request something and I give a, an M&M to say, oh, good job, thanks for looking to me, that's not a natural reinforcer. The preschool teacher may not have those M&Ms or the child's peers. We want that child to also be a reinforcer reward by that fun interaction where we're building that social engagement as well as access to some of the toys or the activities within the activities. The other idea that's really starting to pull from some of those behavioral interventions is thinking about those use of prompts um, in addition to the rewards or reinforcement. And so NDBIs vary considerably in how they structure prompt use and sort of the expectations regarding prompt use. Some of the key ideas are coming back to those ideas that we've been referencing throughout is that we're always thinking about skills that are just one step above what the child's showing. We also want to be very clear, similar to how we've been very clear in our modeling of language and play skills that are one step above. Whenever we're trying to elicit a new skill or support a child in being successful with a new skill, we want the child to know exactly what's going to, exactly how to use that skill and not be, for example, asking a lot of questions or prompts that take the child in many different directions. And then a key idea that we're thinking about so that a child is able to be more spontaneous in some of their skills is to give more support, particularly in the beginning, and fade away some of those supports. Um, if the child doesn't need as much support, we want to leave that so that we can even just give a pause and create an opportunity for that child to spontaneously use that new skill that they're working on, but then also have a plan for how are we going to respond to help that child be effective and be able to, to build some of those skills. 
I also like this picture because if you're less familiar with the idea of prompting and rewarding, which I'm sure that everyone as clinicians on this call does, think about it whenever you're learning to ride a bicycle, right? The first time that you are riding a bicycle, your parent may pretend to put you on a bike, but you know, you need more support. You need more scaffolding or prompts. From there, you then try out the tricycle. Once you're successful there, then we might move to the bike with the training wheels, a little bit less support, and eventually you're then able to go off on the bike without those training wheels. And that's the goal of prompts, is not so that we don't become prompt dependent, but that's so that we're able to take these prompts to move forward and then eventually be able to show these skills without the support. When we think about all of these strategies together, we have our developmental strategies, we have our behavioral strategies, it's constantly on a, a fluctuating continuum. Um, there are gonna be times when we need to be more developmental in our approach because we're trying to elicit some of that social engagement. We need to build that reciprocity for there to even be a teaching opportunity. Um, also, let's say, for example, um, everyone here was very tired and you were very hungry and maybe a couple of you guys were having a tantrum. That's not the best time for us to be learning, right? That's not whenever we're being most likely to build our current skill set. But if we are in, if we're engaged and all of our needs are met right now, and we're also strongly motivated by the activities or something that's a part of this interaction, then we've created an opportunity where we can slide in some of these teaching opportunities more based in applied behavior analysis. Even though we, um, we just wanted to briefly overview some of these strategies, oftentimes these strategies are not only embedded in our direct interactions as clinicians with our patients or our clients, but also creating opportunities where the parents are then able, or caregivers, are able to use these strategies in their daily activities. The goal being that we can increase the opportunities the child has to learn by empowering family members with these strategies. Um, similar to any um, effective adult learning, we think about providing a reason for why we're doing these, why we're teaching particular skills, and providing specific information about what these skills look like and how you can practice them. We move into showing, right? So then being able to model um, through telehealth, we're using video um, in person, we're modeling with the child ourselves. Moving into coaching, then creating those opportunities. We need to have those hands-on opportunities to be able to practice these strategies so that we can troubleshoot and identify where things are more challenging and to be able to see our successes in real time. Once we have that practice opportunity, we can then work with the, we can collaborate with the family to create a plan for the next, let's say, week or the next time period where the, the family is able to put some of these strategies into practice. And like Catherine mentioned, as clinicians in early intervention systems or early intervention settings, we're using a lot of these strategies, right? It, it oftentimes is, it's natural to how we interact with um, children that we're working with. Why it's helpful to be pulling from a manualized NDBI program is that it supports training, but also the consistency of treatment implementation. And so when we think about that, to know that we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing, and so having some of that manualization and opportunity to come back. So what are, how are these strategies supposed to be implemented? And we're able to collect information about fidelity so that we know that whenever, for example, this intervention is being provided with high fidelity, does it result in the outcomes that we hope for for this child? And if not, what, what variables do we need to change so that we can best support young kids' development? We are gonna be talking about a specific NDBI um, on that March 30th talk, but there are many NDBIs with fabulous research bases. So we think about pivotal response treatment, Hannon, um, Project Impact is the one that we'll be speaking about, CERTs and ESI, Early Start Denver Model, JASPER. And again, all of these programs use these core NDBI strategies um, and they vary with some of, um, some of the details related to, for example, prompting or an emphasis on developmental strategies and oftentimes just language as well. And so in a few weeks, if you'll be returning, we would love to meet with you guys again. We'll be talking specifically about Project Impact, Impact for about 30 minutes, going into more detail about how some of these NDBI strategies look specifically with Project Impact. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. If you guys have questions, we would love to answer those now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Picard and Dr. Hendricks. That was so great learning about all those different strategies and that breakdown was very useful. Um, yeah, we'd like to open it up for about five, 10 minutes, just for questions that you guys may have for the presenters about what they discussed. I have a question. Yeah. 
Um, so here, I'll start my video. Um, this isn't exactly, this is related to play. I have a hard time, I'm a physical therapist, so I'm not great at communication and play and stuff. And so if a child is picking up a hairbrush and like trying to brush their hair, is that using the device as it's intended play or is that pretend play? Or if they're brushing their baby's hair with the hairbrush, like what stage of play is that? I think it. I think it's a fabulous question, um, and it depends exactly what the situation is. If they're using their own hairbrush to brush their own hair, versus right using a pretend brush to brush a baby doll's hair, um, you know, I would view the former as just functional use of an object, right? Um, but kind of taking it a step further and knowing that you can actually kind of brush a baby doll's hair. Um, that might be more in the realm of pretend play. A step further would be if the child took the doll's hand and actually had the doll brush its own hair, which would be more kind of like imaginative play. Um, so it kind of depends. Okay, thanks. We had a question in the chat from Angel how should providers decide which model to receive formal training in? It's a great question. Um, I have a few thoughts. Yeah, should go for it. I'll jump in there. Um, I think when you're thinking about a, a model to select, I would think about one, selecting a model that does have existing evidence base, right? So has there been research done to show that it does fall within this category of NDBIs? Um, and I would also see, as you're kind of learning a little bit more about them, what, what best fits within your current practice and also what might um, work very well with, with the center of the setting that you're already working in. So for example, if you're at a, your current practice, others are using Early Start Denver model, it might make more sense to be trained within Early Start Denver model so that you're using similar language and communicating mm -hmm. about those concepts. Mm -hmm. Catherine, what are your thoughts? I agree with that. And I think um, the models differ slightly in um, the cost and kind of the amount of time that it takes. So I think, the, I mean, the good news is you can purchase materials, most of these materials, I shouldn't say all of them, um, but some programs are accessible on like Amazon. Um, if you wanted to get trained in a model, they vary significantly in the cost associated with training. And so that would be another thing to think about if you were going the formal training route, and then they also differ slightly in how flexible they are. Um, and, you know, I think about that a lot. Like as a clinician, it's nice to have a program that can be used flexibly um, and kind of tailored to family needs. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that that is this helpful, but I would definitely be thinking about those things. So I have a question kind of relating to that. I mean, you're talking about fidelity and fidelity is part of ABA therapy and all the steps that go along with fidelity. And yeah, oftentimes in early intervention, we're seeing these families like one or two times at their home. And I mean, life happens. You have five children, they're all running around, whatever. You know, yeah, so I agree. Something, something that's flexible would be great. But then there are all of these programs out there. I mean, you just showed us like 10 different ones, Jasper and the Denver model. And a lot of these, when I see them, I see them in a very um, controlled environment, you know, like a classroom or someplace like that. Our early intervention um, company has kind of talked to us more about like floor time, perfectum, where it's kind of more of that flexible model, but you're still doing all of those NDBI, hope I use that right, correctly. Um, you're using a lot of those strategies. You're following their lead. You're kind of seeing, well, where are you at? Um, but yeah, ultimately I'm not an ABA therapist. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm a special educator. I'm working with their family. And so it is kind of hard to know where does my, I guess, job start and stop because mm -hmm. I'm not trained in how to like specifically give these very direct steps. Like a lot of ABA therapists are, and a, like a lot of these programs tell you to do. Yeah. So ultimately, I guess I'm asking like, 
am I, should I learn some ABA strategies? Should I just learn some of these NBI strategies? Does it matter which one, which program is better over the other one if it's in-home learning? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a fantastic yeah. question. Um, I, let me share just a couple of thoughts. Um, so you're right, right? Like it's the, the NDBIs use behavioral strategies. I would not say that they're ABA. These are, these are, I would think of them as natural teaching opportunities. And so, you know, you're tickling a child, you stop, and then you prompt them to say more, right? And so I think those strategies are very conducive to EI systems, but they are behavioral, right? And so they are, you know, when you think about kind of prior training and, and skill set, they may, there may be strategies that you're more or less comfortable using. Um, I would, I guess I would say when you're choosing a model, um, to choose the one that best fits your, kind of what you're looking for there, I do think there is some benefit to having those naturalistic kind of teaching strategies in your back pocket to be able to pull out and use. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like which program you choose, kind of like Nicole was saying, will depend on like what fits best for your practice setting. Some of these NDBIs, and just one more thought, some of these NDBIs have actually been trialed in the EI system. Um, so there are two specifically that I can think of that have been actually three um, that are currently being done in different EI systems. So really they are meant to be home-based. And which ones are those? Because I didn't see um, floor time. I think floor time is related to Perfectum. I think they're the same thing. I didn't see that on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the reason, so the ones that have been trialed in the EI system are ESDM, um, Project Impact, and ESI, I believe. Um, and floor time, the reason floor time is not on there is it, to your point, it uses all of the developmental strategies. And so it includes things like following the child's lead, imitating the child, um, because it doesn't include these naturalistic teaching strategies, it wouldn't be considered an NDBI because it doesn't have like some of those teaching tools embedded in it. Not to say you wouldn't use them, um, but they're not like explicitly part of it. Okay. And I mean, yeah. that is kind of nice because oftentimes that's what our families are looking for. They're looking for like, how do I just get into my kid's world? <laughs> you yeah. know? So it would be nice to have kind of like that checklist that you're talking about next time as far as like, okay, well, where do I start? Where do I stop? What's my next step? Yes. Yeah. And then coaching the parent on how to do that. So I'm excited for that checklist. That'll be, that'll be good to, um, to use. And then I'll look into these other programs, ESDM, ESI, Project Impact. And you guys are part of Project Impact, or do you use all of these? I think we've both been trained in different models. Like I'm very familiar with floor time. You know, I think as a therapist, right, you pick up tools um, from different places, but we formally use Project Impact um, in our EI clinic. Um, and Nicole can talk a little bit about that. The other thing I wanna make sure we talk about too, when we talk about Project Impact, to your point, is just like, how do you do a program when you're in a home and there are five kids and like things are a little chaotic, right? Um, Cause I do think that's an important point. Thanks. One piece that I was gonna add related to those behavioral strategies is you absolutely do not need to be an ABA therapist or get a BCBA or any of that. This is coming from a BCBA, but I do think that it, it's very helpful whenever you are trying to teach some of those specific skills and the child's not spontaneously imitating to have an understanding not only of what is what is that child's motivation and how can we set up the environment to best support the child of accessing their motivation and also thinking about when we talk about prompts what do those look like and how do we go kind of up and down different kind of types of prompts and what's going to be best suited to that child so i do think that some of those the programs that offer training in naturalistic teaching strategies are really helpful to, to feel empowered and to feel com confident in those moments of, okay, well, I said, what do you want? And the child didn't say anything, right? So what are some different prompts or different ways I can help that child to be successful? Right. Well, and too, I feel like we're hitting parents with like special education 101, right? Like <laughs> this is a lot for them to process mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as antecedent consequences, why they would be acting this way, behavior 
<laughs> it's yeah. a lot for parents to take in too. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because when Catherine mentioned that we've been trained in different models, there's a reason why we gravitate to some models, right? Is how can we cut out the jargon, but keep the, the quality, right? So how do you talk about prompts and rewards without, with never saying reinforcement and never saying contingencies and never saying all that jargon that I hate myself as a BCBA because I know that it creates a barrier between me and the family or me and the teacher, whoever it might be. So how do we keep that high quality and make sure that it's based in some of these sciences where things are coming from, but use language that's accessible for whoever you're working with and making sure that it meets the individual, the parent or the teacher, wherever they might be. Right. So I have a question. Um, I don't know if we're out of time, but- um, We can have one more question. You're good. <laughs> well, it's kind of a big one. So I don't, um, I'm developing, so I'm a supervisor for early intervention program, infant toddler in Idaho, and I'm trying to develop like a system of like autism risk assessment. So when we look at, you know, what supports are needed and feedback sessions and, and things like that. So, um, and we use a PSP approach to teaming. I'm wondering like where you guys fit in, like this is making a lot of sense to me and my brain's exploding, but where do you fit in some of the sensory um, complications um, on top of this, like, cause it's gonna affect communication. It's gonna, you know, all these different parts of where do you guys pull in that? Cause this is very communication based, which, you know, is the base for a lot of things, but where are you guys kind of pulling that in if you have any? Also a great question. <laughs> um, so I, I'll say that most, not most, but some, you're right, and DBIs don't necessarily have an, always have an explicit sensory focus. I mean, I think some are thinking about how do we keep kids regulated? How do we support their engagement? And I think to your point, it's hard to think about being engaged if you're not regulated. Um, and so, you know, I would say that they're not as maybe explicitly targeted as they could be in some programs, but they are, when we think about like, how do you set up, set a child up for success? How do you set an environment up for success? How do you make sure a child is engaged? Those are things that we're thinking about um, if they're not as explicit. I could agree. I don't think that they're explicitly discussed like Catherine mentioned, but I do think that they come up, especially for example, whenever I'm working with families. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with some families where that animation is so important or we need to min minimize that animation, right? The child is overloaded with, this is too much, please stop. Um, I also think about how it relates to what the child's interests might be. And so that it might come up to what kinds of activities are we selecting where the child's really motivated or what activities are we not having available because they become um, challenging for the child or for that interaction. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend a sensory profile to get like a good baseline of like what they are, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I get that our sensory profile changes over time, but to get a good baseline of like what may be overly stimulating or they're, they're, they're under responders, right? So would you consider that in all of this to get a good baseline so you can kind of move forward with interventions? I think so. I think, I think the sensory profile is really helpful to understand a child, right? And, and what sorts of, what sorts of, um, kind of situations or context, um, you know, might make them like they might be sensitive to or, or under sensitive to. Um, so I think it's a good tool to just understand a child better. Um, and that will, I think to Nicole's point inform how might you go about delivering an intervention? What sorts of activities might you include? Or what might you do before an intervention starts to help the child get regulated and get kind of ready to engage? Awesome. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone for all those questions. I'm sorry we don't have more time, um, but just so you know, this isn't your only opportunity to ask questions. I'll explain later about a discussion group that we'll be able to start up so that you guys can ask further questions at a later point. So um, now we'd like to transition to Kirsten Alberg. She's going to present a case for us and um, She'll talk about her child and then we will break out in rooms to talk a little bit about 
maybe recommendations or strategies that we suggest to help Kirsten out. So uh, Kirsten, she introduced herself a little bit earlier, but she is a physical therapist for DDI Vantage here in Utah and also a teacher at the University of Utah. So I'll turn it over to you. Sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself and I couldn't find my mute button. So I think I got you now, right? Yeah, you're good. Okay, awesome. Um, do you guys just see my one slide or do you see my notes? We see your notes as well. Oh, you do? Okay. I'll get rid of those then so that usually it works. Okay. So anyway, I am Kirsten. I am a physical therapist at uh, DDI Vantage in Salt Lake City, and I work primarily in early intervention. So this is my case. This kiddo is a little complicated, and she is a 30-month-old girl. She was diagnosed prenatally with spina bifida. And the family moved to Utah to be closer to the medical center when she was about six months old. And so they actually were in a city in a, um, a large city in a neighboring state, none of which are represented here today. And I was surprised they didn't have the medical support there that they felt like they needed, but they came to Salt Lake to be closer to medical support. So the in-home early intervention services started up as soon as they moved here. And before COVID, it was all in person and it has been mostly telehealth for the past year. And the nurse and I have been in the home since the family moved here. And we brought in a child development specialist to work with some of the cognitive and pre-language skills at about 12 months of age. She wasn't really showing any delays in any of those areas at that point, but with spina bifida, I'd like to bring a child development specialist in because they're at a high risk for cognitive delays. So I like to just make sure that we've got somebody in there that's able to notice some of the subtle signs a little more than I am able to. And then we brought in, she was um, having some, you know, started demonstrating problems not long after that. And we brought in speech therapy at about 23 months of age. Um, she replaced the child development specialist. And then this child also has intermittent esotropia and is farsighted. And so we've got a vision specialist working with her now as well. And then she also goes to outpatient and some of these services go off and on a little bit, but she has received outpatient PT. OT, speech therapy, and feeding as well. And so the child development specialist started noticing some receptive language deficits at about 15 months of age. So when she first came in at 12 months, she was like, why am I in here? The child looks great. I was like, no, really, she's at high risk. Let's, let's keep an eye on her. And so we started knowing, noticing these receptive language deficits. And so we, the family contacted audiology and got a hearing booth test, which was inconclusive. And, um, but then by about 18 to 20 months, we were starting to see less eye contact, um, just less social engagement, less joint attention. And it kind of seemed to change pretty quickly, although it's hard to say because we haven't been in the home much since she was 18 months of age, but she was diagnosed with autism at 24 months of age. She has now had five inconclusive booth hearing tests and is scheduled for an ABR in April. She started receiving ABA in her home in December after she got her ASD diagnosis. And just to make everything really great for the family, she doesn't sleep well, so nobody in the family sleeps really well either. And the family's primary area of concern is really her communication. And so specifically, she just really doesn't respond to verbal communication. And the family would also like to have her commun expressively communicating to them as well. Um, she will sometimes make a choice if she's presented with the options visually. But if you ask her if she wants two different things, even a couple of her favorite things, she doesn't really respond very much to that. But she does seem to respond to sounds. She seems to respond to tons of voice. And you can read her a favorite book. She has favorite books that she gets really engaged with. Um, and she'll know exactly when it's time to turn the page. But she doesn't seem to respond to specific words very much. And then she will self-entertain for quite a while, two or even up to three hours. Um, and so when her family first started, um, when, when we started doing telehealth instead of being in the home, sometime shortly after that was when she stopped taking naps and the mom would comment that she could put her in her crib still and she could have quiet time and she would just sit in there and play 
And this was really helpful for mom to be able to have some downtime with the child just kind of self-entertaining for a while. But, you know, initially she, she said she would do it for about an hour and then pretty soon it was two hours and then it was two or even three hours. And I've got all kinds of alarm bells going off in my head thinking, this isn't good. She shouldn't be self-entertaining for two or three hours. Um, and so also at the same time with the telehealth, we started noticing initially she was really pulling up to the screen and it, trying to engage with mom. And as time went on, we would see her more and more just kind of off doing her own thing and mom just talking to us and the child just being off doing whatever she wanted to do for an hour and not really demanding any attention during that time. She, her favorite toys are little people. So she likes to carry those around with her everywhere and put them up on surfaces and stuff. These are a couple of goals out of her IFSP. So one was that she would listen to spoken language by tracking and turning her head towards the speaker in two out of five opportunities while playing in order to facilitate listening skills. And another goal was that she would request a desired object using any form of communication um, at least five times a day. So these are goals that I believe we are still working on. And a couple of barriers that we have is one is we don't really know what her hearing status is right now. She's had five inconclusive booth hearing tests and the family really wants her to respond to verbal communication and we really don't know how well she can hear. And then she also is she gets tired. She's very active physically crawling around in hands and knees, pulling to stand, walking along furniture. Um, and this wears her out and she's not sleeping well. And then she's got all this ABA that she's supposed to be doing every day. And then she's got multiple medical appointments every week as well. And just a little extra information is um, she did start the ABA therapy in December. And the first couple of weeks were rough. And then she started having a really good positive response. And mom was really happy. But then they increased up to 32 hours a week really quickly. They said they were going to phase up to that. But they did it really just within a few weeks of starting. And she just was too exhausted. And plus, they still had multiple medical appointments every week. And so she just started really throwing a lot of tantrums and wasn't participating. And things were pretty rough there for a while. And initially, the um, family was told by the company that she qualified for 32 hours and she needed to do 32 hours. And so initially, they weren't really willing to work with the family on just how much ABA she was doing. And um, now they have decided they will decrease. The family actually just had COVID. And so they had a couple of weeks without any ABA. And um, they should be back into ABA now and hopefully at a decreased intensity. So I think they were going to do three half days and two full days a week. And then the vision specialist and I were able to meet with the family a couple of times in the fall, late summer and early fall. and. One of the things I see a lot in the autism is a decreased um, just difficulties with visual behavior. And in particular, they have a hard time disengaging attention from one thing and moving to something else, which is super foundational for um, joint attention because you've got to be able to move your, your vision from one thing to look at something else. And so we worked with the mom on some skills specific to the visual motor to help facilitate joint attention and eye contact. And she picked up on some of these skills. I felt like she made some good improvements pretty quickly and we started seeing some changes pretty quickly. And then when the ABA started up, we saw even better changes with that eye contact and joint attention. Things that mom has done in the past that she's worked on a lot and haven't really worked very well for her is modeling simple language. Um, providing choices hasn't helped. The PECS has not worked at all. Uh, she worked on signs a lot for a long time and the child learned how to sign more. And I think even now she's not doing too much of that. So she really only learned one functional sign. She is starting to imitate a few words and even say a couple of words. She'll say baby and puppy. So her favorite little person she calls baby and um, she likes her dog a lot so she'll say puppy um, and then the speech therapist recently has shifted focus to using more tangible communication such as lifting her bowl for more food or pointing to, to the pantry when she's hungry or pointing to the stairs if she wants to go down stairs to crawl around she's got some great stuff downstairs to climb around on so she'll point to the stairs when she wants to go down so she is starting to do some of this gesturing and pointing and then we wanted to talk just a little bit about the family culture as well. So it's a white family, they're middle class. The mom is a stay at home mom. And this is the first child, currently the only child. 
Um, they've got really great emotional support with their family, extended family, but they moved here um, specifically to be near medical support. And so they don't have extended family in the area. So they've got the emotional support, but nobody to just come over and watch the kid for them. Um, they do have a good social network of friends. So as soon as they moved here, this mom jumped right into a bunch of mom and baby classes and really consciously went out and made sure she met people with kids so that she could have people to socialize. So during COVID, they have stayed with, um, you know, they've had certain people that they've kind of been in a bubble with. So they have maintained some contact with the friends here. Um, this is a mom who really likes to have everything in order. And so for her, when she got her prenatal diagnosis of spina bifida, it was really helpful for her to prepare for. But she's talked about just having, really having a hard time with the unknowns with the autism diagnosis. Like, when will she talk? How much will she talk? Um, will she communicate to us? You know, and with us not really being able to answer those things for her, she's really struggling with that. And then isolation has been really difficult for all of us. But I think for this mom in particular, it has been really difficult because she really does need that social contact. And for her to be in this home with this child that she's having a hard time engaging with, um, it's just been a really difficult time. So I don't think that the COVID situation has helped things at all here. Okay, sorry, I flew through that kind of fast. <laughs> I really didn't mean to talk so fast. Um, so anyway, we are going to have some conversations here. The main questions that this family really has is how to get this child to engage and communicate. And particularly the mom really wants, um, wants her to responding to verbal communication. Yeah, thanks Kirsten. So yeah, we're gonna take this opportunity to break out in breakout rooms. And as a group, you'll discuss this child, this case and kind of come up with suggestions about strategies, interventions, or approaches that Kirsten could take to build that communication, thinking about the things that Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Picard talked about and other approaches that you guys may be familiar with in all your years of experience. So um, we'll take an opportunity to do that, to talk about some of those suggestions, and then we'll come back as a group um, and be able to hopefully share just a couple um, in our remaining time. So we'll, we'll do breakout rooms for 10 minutes if that works. Janelle, she's orchestrating these wonderful breakout rooms. <laughs> and please turn on your cameras when you go into the rooms. Mm -hmm.
right, we'll give everyone a minute. They're slowly trickling back in. They'll all be back in about 15 seconds, Kate. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. We must have been the ones that left the room then. <laughs> Oh, 15 seconds is up. There they are. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Um, and just a reminder, the note taker in each of those rooms, if you would please send your notes to earlyecho at usu.edu. That's the email that you've been receiving all um, the registration information to. If you could send those notes um, to that email, that would be great. So we can compile them and give them to Kirsten. Um, but we do have a couple minutes. I would love to hear maybe one or two strategies that you guys discussed in your groups. Any volunteers? Our group had a really great idea. Um, one of the members talked about like a rudimentary hide and seek game. So like playing hide and seek, but having a very obvious hiding spot and then just being very like dramatic and playful of like, where's daddy and encouraging like the pointing and just some of those minimalistic communications. That's great. That's great. I like that. That reminds me of like the predictability that Dr. Picard and Hendricks talked about in getting familiar like with what to expect. Um, and anyone else? I'll share a few of our concerns. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you want our concerns or not, but sure. um, one of them was the amount of therapy this little gal is getting and whether she um, may be very overwhelmed and just not in a position to learn communication right now because her system is so overwhelmed, especially because she's not sleeping well. And another concern was that maybe a sleep um, that would be the first thing that we would address is getting her well rested because all of us know that unless a child is well rested, there's no way that she can learn new skills. And so that was kind of the first thing that we would address is getting her well rested. Also making sure that that, um, that relationship between the child and the parent is really strong because if she is being taken from medical uh, therapies to ABA therapies and all of this. We're wondering how much time she's having with her parents um, to, to develop that kind of um, relationship. And then as far as um, another concern was we, we weren't able to know information as far as what her imitation skills are. And um, a strategy that, that we talked about was to join her with with playing with her little people and whether she would allow us to, to join that play. So those were just a few little things that, that we hit on during our discussion. Yeah, no, thank you. Sleep came up in our group as well as, you know, what, what is her capacity to learn right now if she isn't getting the adequate sleep, so thank you. Um, all right, so just a reminder in the chat, if you have not put your state name, job title and company in the chat, please do so before leaving. That would be really helpful. I'm gonna share my screen one more time for a couple more housekeeping things. So um, as part of this Echo early Echo webinar series, we have created a Canvas account for all of you guys to join. And in order to join it, you need to register. Um, so we will send out an email to register. So look for that. But if by chance you don't get that email to register for the Canvas account, please reach out to either of these emails, the early echo one at usu.edu or um, Kurt Phillips at usu.edu. He's also helping with this Canvas registration. So please, um, look for that and also register by registering, you get access to all the materials 
that we went over the slides and everything. Um, and also that's where the discussion board will be. So you, I know you guys have more questions for Dr. Picard and Dr. Hendricks, so you can post them there and be able to get more answers to your questions. So please do that and reach out if you have any questions regarding registering for Canvas. The other um, thing that we like to share is that we're always looking for um, people who are willing to present a case study similar to what Kirsten did for us today. Um, we'll be joining together on March 30th for another presentation specifically about project impact from Dr. Picard and Dr. Hendricks. And so um, we are recruiting a participant to be able to share their a case, a case study, a child that they're probably working with that they have questions about that they would like some input from the group about. So if you are interested, please reach out to that same email and let us know when we can um, kind of share with you how that process goes and um, give that information to you. So thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I hope that it was useful. And if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to ask. All right. The other thing I'm just going to do a plug really fast is if you will please complete any of the surveys that have been sent out to you, you'll get another one um, after this. And that's how you will get your certificate of attendance. Yeah. Thanks, Janelle. So yeah, complete the surveys. And if you haven't registered for our March 30th webinar, please do that as well. Any other questions? Thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.